ישראל לסיטי אוף אשדוד. And uh, let's take a look on the uh, aerial photograph from 40s, uh, made during the days of British mandate in this area. Uh, and we can see properly uh, that this is a very large site, spanning at least two kilometers from north to south, one and a half uh, east-west. It consists of several clearly definable areas which actually represent different periods of the site's history. A unique feature of these sites is the large main enclosure located at the southern end, and I am uh, pointing out here, you can see it uh, very well actually, uh, which contains a very massive fortification system and associated acropolis uh, dating to the Iron to BC. In our region, it is usually 8th, 7th century BC. In the northern part of the site, there is, you can see it here also on this aerial photograph, there is an impressive Islamic fortress, which was excavated uh, by Israel Antiquities Authority. And uh, uh, I will not uh, talk about this fortress, but it was established already during the days of Caliph Abdel Malik. And uh, the main structure belongs to Fatimid uh, period. And this is uh, uh, really one of the best preserved uh, Islamic fortresses on the Israeli coast. Uh, this is the view of the Acropolis. Uh, it is all covered by sand dunes nowadays. So uh, the view is towards south, toward uh, Ashkelon and Gaza. Ashkelon is 20 kilometers to the south and Gaza just another 20 kilometers to the south of Ashkelon. So this is the, the location basically. Uh, we have a representation of Ashdod Yam, uh, mentioned as the uh, Azotos Paralios, Az uh, Ashdod on the coast, uh, on famous Medaba map, mosaic map from the 6th century AD. And we can clearly see that on this uh, Byzantine mosaic, uh, Azotos Paralios is much uh, uh, bigger and, uh, than the inland uh, uh, capital uh, Ashdod, known also in Byzantine times as the Azotos Mesogios, for instance, inland Ashdod, yes? And we can clearly see that the coastal settlement is, looks, uh, seems to be much more important than the former capital. It seems, however, that this shift of gravity uh, already occurred uh, much earlier. And already during the Iron Age, Ashdod uh, Yam, Ashdod by the sea, became perhaps even more important than uh, the former capital in terms of uh, archaeological remains, which we shall discuss uh, in a minute. Uh, so the, first of all, the Tel Ashdod, the capital of this region, uh, was excavated in the 60s by Moshe Dotan uh, for several seasons and extensively published. Uh, and uh, I will not deal here with the results of his excavations, which are well known. Uh, he discovered the huge Canaanite city, which became during the late Bronze Age an Egyptian stronghold. And later on, as I already mentioned, it became one of the five uh, major cities uh, populated by Philistines. And Ashdod uh, became a, an original power, especially during the, uh, during the eighth century BC, after the destruction of Gat, of, uh, of Gat El Tzafi in the late ninth century by Hazael, Ashdod became a regional power until the arrival of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians uh, 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 actually uh, have arrived in the late eighth century BC. And in the late eighth century BC, in, namely in 614 approximately, we hear about unrest in the city of Ashdod, in the kingdom of Ashdod. And uh, uh, there is a rebellion against the Syrians. So uh, in due course, uh, the people of Ashdod, they installed the, a certain Yamani, which is a, a person who is named Yamani, sometimes Yadna. We hear about this uh, person also as Yadna. So it could be also Cypriot, actually, which is actually quite relevant to to this presentation for today. Uh, some hypothesize that some scholars hypothesize that maybe we are talking about a Cypriot mercenary uh, who uh, was chosen or became a tyrant. Perhaps uh, it's, not, it's not entirely clear uh, how he took the, the power in Ashdod. 
In any event, uh, uh, the city was rebellious uh, against the Assyrian regime in the days of Sargon, and Sargon decides uh, to assemble forces and to punish the city. And we know this very well from Sargon's annals and display inscriptions, that inscription that he besieged and conquered the city of Ashdod, its towns, carried the spoils and deported the royal family and many inhabitants. Uh, organization uh, of the new Lenex province uh, in his own walls, these cities are rebuilt anew and settled the Rhine people from the regions of the east that I had conquered, and I installed an officer of mine over them and counted them with the inhabitants of Assyria, and they bore my yoke. Uh, the site Ashdod Yam is mentioned specifically in uh, Sargon's description as, as Asdudimu, uh, as one of the three cities. Uh, which we conquered during this campaign, together with Ashdod and Gat. It is a very problematic which Gat actually uh, is mentioned here, uh, but I will not discuss the, the identification of this Gat uh, because we have no time for this. In any event, uh, following this uh, prison of Yamani, all, all Ashdod Yam and Ashdod were conquered, and uh, Sargon reorganized the territory and made it the center of a newly established province, as, as I said, conducted deportation and settled a number of newcomers. Sennacherib, this is Sargon, Sennacherib, his son, adopted a different policy a few years later. He let the former royal house of Ashdod rule out of the kingdom side by side with the Assyrian governor. So we have a very peculiar installation here. We have a local uh, royal house uh, and uh, nearby, uh, closely watching uh, an Assyrian government, uh, and this is quite unusual uh, for, for the Assyrian Empire, uh, which probably emphasizes the importance of this place for the Assyrians. The destruction, the so-called destruction of uh, Sargon II has been attested during, attested during the excavations of uh, Dotan at Tel Ashdod, and it is also attested archeologically and uh, it is mentioned in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 21. Uh, it is said that in the year that Tartan, Tartan, it is general actually, uh, came, a general on behalf of Sargon, came into Ashdod when Sargon, the king of Asura, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. And during the excavations of Moshe Dotan, he discovered uh, several mass, mass burials which uh, included some 3,000 skeletons, many of them were mutilated. Also, and you see the picture, also uh, broken pieces of Assyrian stelae from the days of Sargon II were found on the top of, the, of Tel Ashdod, uh, and they probably relate to these, uh, ev to these events. I have to say that these bones were uh, considered as uh, lost for the signs, uh, and only recently, uh, we were lucky to rediscover these bones in the storehouses of the Hebrew University. And as we speak, uh, the results of DNA uh, have uh, already arrived, the first results, and we have now a complete uh, uh, genomic uh, sequence for at least 30 individuals, uh, presumably Philistines, slaughtered by Assyrians in the late 8th century. And I will make a scoop. It is still unpublished, but uh, at least uh, according to uh, DNA analysis, many of them, actually almost all of them, they have this uh, 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 peculiar uh, haplotype, these uh, genes that uh, point to Aegean uh, origin, the ones that we, which were already detected during the DNA analysis in Ashkelon, but in Ashkelon, they have obtained these results only for four individuals. And here we have uh, more. And from 8th century, which is very unusual and peculiar, but this is, as I said, still unpublished, so it's just a scoop, and we shall move on. Uh, following this destruction, <clears throat> uh, as I already mentioned, Sinakiri uh, allows to royal uh, house uh, uh, to keep uh, ruling, actually. And nearby, near Tel Ashdod, a governor, a governor fort uh, or a governor house uh, was established, and it was excavated <coughs> a palace, actually. You can call it a palace. It, it is perhaps the only Assyri real Assyrian palace discovered so far 
in Israel. And uh, it was uh, excavated uh, by Israel Antiquities Authority some uh, 25 years ago, only partially uh, in a very uh, limited form, but the results were spectacular in a Syrian type building with a Syrian uh, 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 square mud bricks. Uh, it's, it is totally unlocal. It is uh, not related to local architectural tradition. The pottery was local though, except for these uh, peculiar uh, tabs, uh, which point to a Syrian origin as well. And we know that the year 669 uh, uh, bear the, the eponym of uh, Shamash Kashid Ayabi, who was the governor of Ashdod. So the, the, that year was labeled after the governor of Ashdod, uh, which again, uh, again emphasizes the importance of the city in the Assyrian eyes. Now to Ashdod Yam. Uh, Ashdod Yam should be somehow incorporated into this picture because uh, Sargon said that he brings uh, new people and uh, settle them in the area of Ashdod. With these questions in mind, some uh, uh, 60 years ago, Jacob Kaplan uh, has arrived to Ashdod and, uh, and tried uh, to understand this uh, uh, fortification system, which I've already mentioned. At the beginning, <clears throat> Kaplan's, Kaplan was under the impression that this fortification system was established in the Middle Bronze Age, but after he conducted the first series of excavations, he made 10 uh, uh, sections here with the uh, tractors, actually. So very uh, rude, but, but in big sections inside of these fortification uh, walls. And, uh, and he uh, correctly identified these uh, as not belonging to Middle Bronze Age, but rather to the Iron Age, because he discovered only Iron Age to be pottery inside and outside of this fortification system. And he identified this with the, with the uh, Yamani or Yadna uh, attempt to uh, establish uh, a fortified stronghold uh, in the eve of the Assyrian invasion. So these uh, fortifications actually consisted uh, of glacis and in the in the and the ramparts and in the middle of this uh, complicated system Kaplan has identified the four four and a half meters thick mud brick wall which served as a core for a large earthen ramparts and outer glacis laid on both sides uh, and as I said Kaplan suggested that this uh, this uh, impressive fortification was created by Yamani uh, in the late uh, 8th century before the arrival of uh, the Assyrians. Kaplan also suggested that uh, uh, an additional segment of the wall, which would have fully enclosed the compound, stood at the western edge of the mound, and it was destroyed by erosion. You can see it here. So the wall uh, for the fortification, this is here, yeah, the fortification, uh, uh, is, uh, did not preserve in this area. So Kaplan thought that it disappeared because of the erosion toward the sea, and the, the whole compound was enclosed by these huge fortification walls and ramparts. Uh, also, since the Iron Age pottery was found during the survey of the site beyond the ramparts, it is suspected that the fortified enclosure was part of much larger settlement, which may be buried under accumulation from the classical periods. Uh, with these questions in mind, uh, we have arrived in 2013, and uh, on behalf of the Institute of Archaeology of Tel Aviv University, I have started my investigations in Ashdod Yam, first of all on the Acropolis. Here you can see the LIDAR uh, uh, image, so you can clearly see the Acropolis, you can see the fortification system like a horseshoe, uh, and you can see this wide opening toward the sea. And from the beginning, and here, this is the Islamic fortress here, and this is the Roman Byzantine, huge Roman Byzantine city. So from the beginning, it was quite obvious that this huge opening, it would be very difficult to explain in terms of the erosion toward the sea. Uh, we've conducted a series of uh, archaeogeological investigations in this area, <clears throat> in this crater, here 
and in this uh, uh, area which connects between the settlement and the sea. So we've uh, conduct magnetometry, we've conduct uh, 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 GPR, ground penetrating radar analysis, uh, we've conducted uh, core drillings uh, in many, many places. We've conducted uh, in many places inside of this crater uh, in order to, to understand uh, what's going on here. And if uh, the, the idea of Kaplan about the erosion of the fortification toward the sea is correct, we didn't find any trace of any fortification here. And it all looks uh, like it's a, 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 it's a huge crater, which was, it seems to us now, we also did the, by the, yeah, I'm just showing you a little bit of uh, core uh, drills, which we uh, took from there. So you see 15, 14, 13 meters of sand. Uh, it was covered by dunes uh, during the last uh, uh, two, uh, uh, 2000 and more years. But uh, once you go deeper and you try to, to reach the rock, to reach the bottom of the rock, uh, we are quite, we also did seismic survey in order to realize uh, the depth of the rock in different parts of the site. It became clear that uh, during the antiquity, there was an ancient uh, river, probably a branch of uh, River Lachish that ran here toward the sea. And the site was established at the estuary of this ancient river, and it seems that this opening uh, was designed from the beginning in order to create an artificial, man-made uh, harbor, maybe it's a big word, but the anchorage, sort of cotton, uh, and if you wish, uh, this is uh, perhaps a reconstruction of how presumably it would look like, you would need a, a permanent maintaining of such, uh, of such an undertaking uh, because uh, uh, it will take uh, just uh, a few decades and if you do not maintain it, it will be completely uh, covered by sands because of this constant movement of the sand from Nile and from Egypt toward the coast of Israel, toward north, uh, northern part of Israel. Uh, but we should re re recall that uh, this part of Israel, the southern coast, is very poor in terms of natural shelters for the ships. And uh, between Tel Ridan in Gaza Strip, uh, where there is located the natural anchorage, uh, pretty decent, but not, not, not highest quality, but still pretty decent, and Yavne Yam uh, anchorage, which is located 20 kilometers to the north of Ashdod Yam. It's also pretty decent anchorage, but again, it's natural heaven for ships, it's not man-made, uh, it's not the best one, yeah? Uh, so be be between Tel Ridan and Yavne Yam, there are no, uh, there are no known uh, uh, shelters for ships, and even Ashkelon, the famous port of Ashkelon, it seems that uh, actually the ships were forced uh, uh, to uh, anchor uh, in the sea, deep in the sea, so, uh, all kind of communication between the ships and the and the coast were conducted using small boats. So this kind of undertaking uh, would be of uh, Im immense importance, of course, uh, during the antiquity. And this is at least how we try to reconstruct this at the moment. Uh, following the geoarchaeological investigation, we started to excavate on the Acropolis. And uh, initially, I came to this site uh, having in mind the idea that I'm going to excavate a site from 8th, 7th century, 8th, 7th century BC, uh, because Kaplan did not deliver any, uh, any word about later remains. So I was pretty, uh, pretty convinced that what is uh, expecting uh, to us there is actually uh, late Iron Age remains, and I would be very much interested to excavate the 8th, 7th century BC site, uh, clarifying the modes of imperial control, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and the different uh, populations, Phoenicians, Philistines, newcomers, which were brought by the Assyrians. These, with these questions in mind, we came to the site, 
And it was, uh, during the investigation, it was obvious that uh, something, uh, it, that it's not going to happen, yeah? So first of all, when we started in 2013, uh, first season, uh, we didn't discover any shared from the Iron Age, uh, only Hellenistic period. And next season, uh, again, only Hellenistic period on the Acropolis. So uh, myself and my team, uh, we became uh, to be a little bit, uh, you know, worry about this uh, idea that uh, maybe actually uh, Kaplan was wrong uh, from the beginning. So we went to one of Kaplan's uh, trenches where he touched the, the fortification system only from above where, and where he didn't cut it all the way to the ground. And they called it, this is area B. Uh, this is the Acropolis here. You see it here. I will talk about this in the minute, but we went first uh, to this area in order to see if the fortifications are uh, indeed belong to the Iron Age. And when we opened the area there, we were lucky enough to discover that the wall still stands. The mud brick, uh, the huge mud brick wall uh, reported by Kaplan is there. We excavated uh, these uh, segments of this wall all the way. You can see here the, the, the traces of Kaplan's earth moving machine. Then he scratched the area. So we excavated these uh, segments all the way down to the surfaces and we found pottery on the surfaces, beneath the surfaces, it is all dated to iron to B. It's actually, it looks more eighth century BC, uh, not seventh century, eighth century BC, uh, quite in line with uh, Kaplan's uh, idea. But uh, uh, it seems to us now that uh, such a huge compound, it is really enormous. It is perhaps one of the biggest construction uh, uh, activities which were undertaken in the Southern Levant in the Iron Age. It is really huge because the area uh, where the wall which stood in the center as the core of these huge embankments, the area that was already detected runs for more than one mile. So this uh, horseshoe, uh, more than one, one mile of this wall inside of the huge embankments, it, you simply physically cannot construct something like this in a year or two, as Kaplan has suggested. So it, it, it looks to us now that uh, <clears throat> these uh, 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 huge fortifications were constructed by the uh, Kingdom of Ashdod before the arrival of the Assyrians, because several scholars have claimed that these uh, fortifications should be uh, should uh, relate to the Assyrians and not to the Ashdodians, it seems to us that the construction techniques they clearly point uh, to the local initiative. And after the uh, kingdom of Ashdod was conquered uh, and became a vassal uh, state on behalf of the Assyrian regime, of course, the port and the associated structures were incorporated into the realm of the empire. But the construction, it, it seems to us, belongs to the local uh, initiative at the beginning somewhere, perhaps in the early 8th century BC. So this is how the wall from the 8th century BC looks like, the mud brick walls. Once you remove the sand, it looks like it was built yesterday. The state of preservation is amazing. Uh, here, are a few segments of the wall, we checked uh, the construction techniques. We made a lot of analysis. You see all these numbers. These are uh, the samples uh, taken from mud bricks and the uh, uh, plaster, et cetera, et cetera. There are many layers of plaster. So it is obvious that it, will, it took a lot of time to create this, uh, this fortification, which in our opinion enclosed this man-made harbor. And uh, this is again the close up to the wall. Uh, with the abutting surfaces, and the, you can see the construction technique of the 8th century BC. Uh, nearby, just near the wall, we discovered a small uh, favisa uh, of some, uh, uh, with some cultic vessels. Maybe it is related to some kind of uh, uh, cultic performance which uh, took place there when one of the segments of the walls was completed. We don't know that for sure, of course, but it's still a nice find. On the Acropolis, we've continued to excavate and we've discovered several uh, big administrative buildings, uh, which uh, at the moment uh, could be dated to uh, 7th century BC. Uh, they probably 
there are, there are also remains. We have some remains from the 8th century BC, but uh, not that impressive at the moment, but from the 7th century BC. Uh, actually, from the late 7th century BC, once the uh, Assyrians already left the region after Assyrian withdrawal, we have a short period of what is called the Egyptian interlude before the arrival of the Babylonians. In this period of some 30 years, in the late third of the 7th century BC, we have an administrative structure here in Ashdod Yam, uh, which probably reuses a structure from the earlier period, but the pottery remains, East Greek pottery, local pottery, Egyptian finds on the floors, they uh, clearly point out to the late 7th century BC for this structure with an open courtyard. Uh, now, uh, the structure uh, was totally destroyed. We have the uh, signs of destruction, uh, which probably relates to Babylonian destructions and should be connected somehow with the destruction of Ashkelon in 604 BC as well. But we should keep in mind that among other Philistine cities, only the city of Ashdod and maybe also Gaza, they still, but Ashdod for sure, they still possessed uh, Ashdod still possessed a king in the early 6th century when Ashkelon and the Kron were already totally destroyed. And we know this uh, uh, from the, the uh, Istanbul, uh, uh, Istanbul prism of uh, Nabuchadnezzar <laughs> the second, uh, where uh, king of Ashdod is specifically mentioned uh, as, uh, uh, in the list of vassal kingdoms. So, Ashdod still possesses a king uh, of local dynasty, it seems, uh, in the early 6th century. We don't know his name, but uh, afterwards, uh, there is a hiatus, uh, perhaps during the lion's share of the Babylonian periods until the, uh, until the arrival of the, Persian, uh, of the uh, Persian power, of course, and later on Hellenistic. Uh, we don't have uh, anything from the Persian period except for a few coins on the Acropolis of Tel Ashdod and the next, uh, sorry, Ashdod Yam, and the next period which uh, was attested during the excavations, actually, we, th th that was the period that we encountered from the beginning, and we didn't want to excavate this period because I was more interested in the Iron Age, but still we excavated, we invested uh, two seasons at least in understanding the Hellenistic structures, so you have a series of Hellenistic structures, which uh, encompassing a huge uh, uh, fort. Uh, here we excavated only partially this fort. Uh, all of these structures they dated to the uh, second uh, century BC, and they were established on the remains of the Iron Age. Sometimes there is a weak layer of sand between the Hellenistic remains and the Iron Age remains, so it seems that the Acropolis uh, was abandoned for a long period, and the port, the anchorage, uh, after such a long period uh, uh, of neglection, uh, went out of use, of course, so it was completely covered by sands uh, by then, and somewhere in the second century, it seems that the uh, Hellenistic, uh, uh, Hellenistic powers, uh, specifically the Seleucid Empire, uh, based on the based on the uh, archaeological material uncovered here, Seleucid Empire is responsible for establishment uh, here of a, a garrison garrison side, which was manned by mercenaries and soldiers in the service of Seleucid Empire. So I'm just will show you a few remains. So we have these small houses, uh, some of them were built uh, uh, um, with stones uh, when the lower course made of uh, local beach rock and the upper course is made of mud bricks. Some of them, uh, some walls were made uh, completely of mud bricks without even uh, stone foundations. Uh, and all these uh, small houses and walls, they uh, encompassed this huge fort, as I said, which we only partially excavated because we were not interested in this fort, uh, but uh, we invested some time and energy into this fort. So you can see here a huge uh, monumental wall, uh, almost totally robbed in antiquity, but uh, huge pillars, each uh, 10, 12 ton pillars, 
uh, uh, they still remain uh, in situ. So you can see this wall running from north to south, for example. And in photogrammetric reconstruction, you can see the pillars that they still still stand in situ, but the wall was completely robbed in the antiquity. Only the lower course of the wall uh, has survived. You can see it here. And because the wall was robbed, uh, this mon monumental structure was, it seems uh, the stones were uh, uh, heavily robbed. The uh, abutting floors, they started already in antiquity, they started to collapse inside the robber trench. So we were able to expand a little bit to excavate some of the material on the floor, from the floor, beneath the floors, and the material belongs, as I said, purely to second century BC with clear signs of destructions, uh, destruction and, uh, in the late second century BC. We have uh, uh, approximately 250 coins uh, identified and uh, already uh, catalogized. Uh, Almost all of them belong to a uh, Seleucid uh, uh, empire. Uh, and, uh, but also we have some uh, peculiarities. For example, here, these are some Persian period coins, which are very rare actually, but we also find them, silver coins from the Persian period, which were in circulation in later periods as well. And we found a lot of bronze coins uh, from particular city states like uh, Sidetes in this uh, uh, in this case, and from Arvad, from Phoenician Arvad, it seems to us that this fort was meant by, uh, as I said, by garrison consisted of soldiers, uh, soldiers from, uh, from different uh, ethnic uh, backgrounds in the service of the uh, Seleucid Empire. Some uh, nice finds, a uh, mag magical amulet in a very good state of preservation. A, a lot of metal finds, uh, <clears throat> ballista stones, and uh, weaponry. Weaponry, which clearly, this, these are uh, the AP2 from Ashdod Yam, for example, with the monogram Epsilon Beta, the same, exactly the same uh, arrowheads were discovered in Seleucid uh, garrison site in Jebel Khalid in North Syria, North Syria. So we have a clear connection to the second century BC. And uh, as I said, the site was destroyed in the late century BC. It seems uh, due to the presence of uh, historical sources, we know that the area was destroyed by uh, Maccabeans uh, in the late second century BC. And it seems that we have this, uh, uh, this destruction attested quite well in our site in Ashdod Yam. Uh, during the excavations, uh, I was approached by my friends and colleagues from the Israel Antiquities Authority, and uh, it was during the third or fourth season, I don't remember, and they asked me, they told me, look, you are excavating here at the Acropolis, uh, but you are dealing with the entire area of Ashdod Yam, you are interested in this site, why don't you check, there is a certain spot, uh, it is located approximately one and a half kilometers to the north from the place that you excavate, but it still belongs to Ashdod Yam. You see it here in this uh, white dot. Uh, among the villas of Ashdod, uh, there are tessera, colorful tessera, tessera uh, mosaic stones, which continuously popping out for the last 40 years or something. So can you please send a few volunteers and just uh, check uh, what's going on there, um, if you want to. I said, why not? Uh, let's check. Why not to check? So it was during 2017 uh, when we when we've, uh, we've sent a few volunteers, uh, three or four people, brave people, and they started to brush the area, actually, not even to excavate, to brush the area. And immediately after less than one hour, uh, we had, a f uh, so this is the area, this is the Islamic fortress, which I've already mentioned at the beginning, and this is the area, as you see, among the villas of uh, Ashdod, of modern Ashdod, and immediately after one hour of brushing, they had the first inscription, uh, which uh, can be, uh, which was uh, translated, all translations here by uh, Dr. Lea Diseni, from the, uh, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, who worked very hard uh, because we have 13 inscriptions. Yeah, I will show you just a few. 
but that was the first one. Uh, by the grace of God, uh, Christ, this work was done from the foundation under Procopius, our, our most saintly and most holy bishop, in the month of Dios, third indiction year 292. Uh, and if we translate uh, this year 292 into our system, and I will uh, mention this uh, in a few minutes, uh, what system is being used here, we uh, receive a month of Dios, we receive November, 539 40 AD. So we have a very nice inscription uh, <clears throat> of a bishop which was previously unknown uh, from historical sources. And uh, once we continued uh, during this trial, the excavation, it was not even excavation, it was just uh, brushing the area, just cleaning the area. We've discovered this room and the inscription was right at the entrance uh, to this room. Uh, so I left my crew there and I uh, returned to the tail, to the Acropolis, because I was looking for Iron Age, actually. And in a few hours, I get another phone call. Alex, we have another inscription. Come, come and see. So I arrived again, just brushing, not much digging, another inscription. So I decided, OK, we have to stop. It, 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 it cannot be done like this. Inscription number one, inscription number two, you see the excavated parts during this trial. It's not even season, it's a, it's a trial attempt. A, let's call it a trial season, yeah? So we stopped, we covered the remains, and I decided that in 2019, once we will return to the Acropolis, we will divide the expedition into two parts. One part will continue on the Iron Age Acropolis to excavate the Iron Age structures, and the other, section, the other part of the expedition will, uh, will excavate the Byzantine, uh, the Byzantine church. So uh, in between, we did several uh, geoarchaeological investigations here in this area. In particular, we did the electrical resistance survey with uh, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Paul Brinza, uh, American physicist who accompanied uh, me there for for many years and helps uh, in this adventure. Uh, and uh, Dr. Hall from uh, England who brought the equipment. So we did electrical resistance survey and we could clearly see here, uh, as you see this uh, black spot, it looks like a small apse. So we were under the impression that we have a small church, uh, which could be easily excavated uh, during one season, let's say in a month or, or so. So we returned to the site in uh, 2019, as I said, and this is what we found uh, at the end of the excavation. So the first inscription is here. The second inscription is here. The apse was indeed here, but it was, at, but it was a small apse which relates not to the church, but to a chapel that uh, was uh, attached to a, to a church. So only at the end of this season, we realized that actually this whole series of structures, uh, th this is the not actual basilica. The basilica is, uh, is not here. Basilica is, a, this, these are the structures with, that attach to basilica. And uh, it was obvious to us, this is the plan, that the basilica should be located uh, to the south. Uh, so we excavated only partially one of the, the northern aisle, and their accompanying structures. And we've decided that in 2021, we will return in 2020 was Corona, was a COVID year. In 2021, we will return uh, in full force and we will excavate only the Byzantine structure without any Iron Age Acropolis in order to finish this and to understand what's going on. So Alexander Van Talkin went uh, all the way from the Iron Age to Hellenistic and ended up with the Byzantine church. And I have no regrets at all. I'm actually very happy about it. This is what archeology span is all about. You start something, you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Unfortunately, this villa was built in the eighties, right on the narthex of this church and atrium. Uh, and uh, it ruined a lot, quite a lot. This is what we excavated during the second season, and we excavated here all these parts during the first season in 2021. So this is what we got. We also conducted the GPR, 
and GPR before the excavation, it was clear that the charge is here. So ground penetrating radar uh, was also very useful here. So we, we used two different uh, techniques here, electrical resistance and the ground penetrating radar. For electrical resistance, you need moisture in the ground. For ground penetrating radar, you need the ground uh, without any moisture. So it was very useful to combine between these two techniques. And this is what we found uh, last year, actually. No, we are now 2023. So yeah, it was in the summer, late summer 2021, yeah, more than a year ago. So it's the main, the main charge, the main basilica, 19 by 20, almost 24 meters. Uh, you can see it clearly here, uh, the entire excavated complex. And you see this villa, which actually uh, has ruined a, a huge portion of the uh, of this complex somewhere around uh, 1980 something like this when this villa was uh, created and this is really a crime against humanity i call it but uh, back then israel antiquities authority was weak uh, today it is simply impossible to imagine anything like this it would it, it cannot happen simply cannot happen but back then as i said the Israel Antiquities Authority was uh, not a strong organization, was, uh, and, uh, and uh, they simply had not, they, they, they had no enough power and not so many inspectors. So these uh, crimes uh, uh, did happen. And this is, uh, but at least we were able to save uh, the rest of the complex during our ex excavation. So this is how it looks like. I will go very briefly because I have no time. Uh, but it is a very impressive complex. It is one of the earliest churches uh, found so far in Israel. Uh, it has uh, 13, 13 inscriptions, some of them very long. Uh, it, it features a lot of pecu peculiarities. Uh, so the church, uh, of course, we have a nave, uh, the, which was partially destroyed, but we, we have a major apse with the presbyterium and bema. We have the southern aisle uh, only partially preserved, but the northern aisle was preserved in its entirety. And we have the chapel and the probably diaconicon and partially narthex. And this first room where we started our excavation, remember this uh, Bishop Procopius, it was here, the inscription was located here. From here we started, and this is what we got eventually. So uh, uh, we can date uh, this charge uh, in very, very solidly between, let's say, 400 and 600 AD, uh, at least 400 AD. And we can clearly see the constructional phases, which uh, could be dated both archaeologically and also uh, with the help of the inscriptions, because we have so many inscriptions, dated inscriptions, uh, dispersed around uh, uh, the church area. So this is the area of Presbyterium. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, floor here did not survive, uh, but you can see uh, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the major apse, there is a single tomb uh, of the holy person or saint or martyr uh, and the bones are now being investigated again uh, uh, for further analysis that was the only tomb that was not what was not reused later on because all other tombs tombs which we excavated were reused in the sixth century uh, for ma mass uh, burials and i will show you in a minute so from here we jump to the earliest inscription attested so far here in the southern isle uh, ah, this is the tomb of the saint uh, after we opened it. And this is the earliest inscription, uh, which again miraculously has, uh, has survived. You see it was completely ruined by tractors uh, here, but it could, you see it's a very long inscription with uh, something here. Uh, you will see it in a minute what it is here. So what, is the, what the inscription says, the inscription says that so and so, Given thanks to God, paved the mosaic, the stoa, the isle of the holy martyrium, and the Heraclius, the most God fearing bishop of this place, it was paved with the, in, with the mosaic in the year 169, which gives us 415, 16 
see common era by the era starting in November 247. It's, this is the millennium, the era of millennium of Rome. I will talk about this in a minute if I still have time. For the memory and repose of our Holy Father Gaianus, the priest, and of Severa the Deaconess. Bishop Heraclius, it should be mentioned, is known from the second consul of Ephesus and Chalcedon. So here we are connecting to a real person about whom we know that he attended the consuls of Ephesus and Chalcedon, and this is really exciting. And the date is very early, 415. It, uh, it means that uh, at this date, the, the church was already in place. So the church could be uh, could could be built already the, the the first compound in four around 400 maybe even late fourth century. So it makes it one of the really one of the earliest churches discovered so far in Israel, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, now uh, here you see this uh, very rude uh, pavement. So the the deliberate the elaborate sorry elaborate mosaic pavement was destroyed sometimes in the antiquity and covered with these rude slabs and the rude mosaic patches. So once we opened it, we discovered a, a very elaborated tomb, uh, which probably belonged to Gaianus and Severa. And we discovered, the, the, we, discovered the, uh, we discovered a lot of skeletons here, but uh, during the sixth century, it seems, uh, these tombs were turned into mass graves because they were uh, full with skeletons, some uh, 12, 13 skeletons of children and adults were thrown here inside of these tombs and partially covered by these mosaic patches and marble slabs. Now, it is very interesting because uh, we were able to identify during the excavation of these tombs in the lowest level, we identified the original inhabitant of the tomb I don't know if it is a Gainus mentioned in the inscription, but it was a couple, two skeletons, and one of them, uh, we call him uh, a martyr. Uh, this is the top of the skull. The state of preservation of bones was not that good, but inside the skull, there was an iron spear, which is really, really amazing. You, you don't have this kind of finds usually. It's, you know, only read about this in the literature, but you, you, you it's very rare to find something like this. Uh, I don't know any parallels actually for this. So you have, you see this iron spear inside of this head. So that was the reason of uh, this person's death. And maybe that was the martyr. Uh, this is the part, part of the spear in, uh, taken in, from his uh, skull. Uh, but on top of these uh, two original inhabitants of this grave, we have this mass burial from the sixth century, clearly dated to the sixth century with coins, etc. And it was a mass burial and people were thrown away and harshly covered by patches of this mosaic. We've discovered this, uh, this, uh, uh, the same situation in other places where we opened the burials. The whole, the whole area of church is covered with burials. We opened several of them. And at the entrance and the narthex of the church, I will go back in a second uh, just to show you where it is. Here, in the narthex, here, uh, we found a huge slab here, a huge slab uh, cover that covered the tomb uh, of uh, Theodorus Magistrianus. Uh, so there is an inscription here. Well, we, we were under the impression that we will, we will find the tomb of a single individual. One we, once we opened the tomb, we found another mass burial with some 15, maybe even 20 skeletons inside, uh, all messed and covered by, uh, and covered by uh, lime. Uh, so it's, uh, here you see it after the excavation. Of course, the, the, the main question now, the most interesting question would be, perhaps we have here, uh, an archaeological uh, uh, evidence for so-called Justinianic plague. Uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, uh, the, the DNA samples from the tooth, uh, because the Yersinia pestis, this Cocobacillus bacterium, uh, which, uh, uh, which is the cause of the plague, uh, it, could, it could be detected only in the in the root of the tooth, yes, the person dies very quickly, 
and the, it uh, will not penetrate the bones. So now the samples from the two far at the, at the lab in Tübingen, uh, the one which is the most famous and they spe specializes in the in Yersinia pestis, and I'm uh, uh, waiting uh, every day to have to get the results. So we'll see. Uh, uh, stay tuned, and if we if we do find the Yersinia pestis uh, in these mass burials, which are clearly dated to the sixth century, that would be, of course, a discovery of immense importance. So uh, just a few more words about the inscriptions. What is also very unusual about this church is a huge number of, uh, uh, of inscriptions and tombs dedicated to deaconesses. Some uh, scholars, Byzantine scholars, they already uh, labeled this church as the church of deaconesses. And here you see the one very impressive one in the northern aisle here. Uh, one of the most impressive, but we have many of them. The whole, the whole section here is covered with the tombs of the deaconesses and deacons also, but mainly deaconesses. And here we have the one for the memory of Theodosia, the deaconess, Chris Lavin, fell asleep in the month of Daisos, year 194. So it gives us 19th of July, 442. Uh, and this is how it looks like uh, with the... Uh, uh, so the tomb is actually beneath beneath the mosaic floor. Just beneath the tomb, we have another one for the memory of Gregoria, the deaconess from Betulion. Uh, and beneath that, we have, it is very unusual, we have came to rest the blessed Maximus, the deacon. So we have women, female uh, de deaconesses and we have uh, uh, men uh, all together, but females, uh, extremely prominent in this church, which is also very unusual, and of course it brings the brings us to the uh, to the discussion about the role uh, of women and especially the order of the deaconesses in the early church, the responsibilities, etc., uh, etc. Et I will not discuss it here. It should be probably reserved for for other occasions but it is extremely interesting. Uh, just to show you a few uh, more slides before I end, uh, this is the chapel with very elaborated, uh, the, the, the chapel, the northern chapel attached to the main basilica with very elaborated mosaics. Uh, this is how it looks like. We've collected the, the, every possible shared uh, of the roof tile. The state of preservation was amazing because in the antiquity, around 600, when uh, the church was destroyed, violently destroyed, we see the traces of this destruction uh, all around. It was actually probably uh, uh, abandoned in a planned manner and destroyed afterwards. Uh, the roof collapsed and sealed the mosaic floors. So we have the entire roof uh, made of roof tiles. Uh, by the way, very interesting. The the basilica was covered by roof tiles from Cyprus. The analysis has dem have demonst uh, demonstrated that the roof tiles uh, are originating from Cyprus, and also the wood. The wood comes from Sylvester pine, which is also from Cyprus, it seems. And the uh, the chapel. Chapels were covered by uh, tiles uh, which were made uh, locally. So it's also another interesting uh, thing to show. So we collected everything and we are able to reconstruct the entire roof at the moment. So just showing some few uh, close ups for the mosaics in the chapel. And another inscription. Uh, and I said it's, it's inscription uh, of Stephanus who fallen asleep with fathers and will reign in heaven. And it, he was uh, uh, placed there in 455. So we have found a lot of coins. All of them are now, uh, have been identified. And as I said, we have it's the, 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 the time, the, it's between late Roman, late fourth century coins, and it stops around the, uh, uh, it, 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 let's say, 600 would be the latest, because the latest coins are from 580, 590, something like this. We have approximately 200 years for the existence of this 
peculiar charge. Marble items, a lot of uh, a, a lot of metal finds like polycandela suspensions for handing lamps, a lot of glass uh, finds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And here I'm uh, coming to an end. It's uh, I'm already beyond I think uh, my mandate. Uh, I just want to uh, to mention that uh, uh, among all other Philistine cities, only Ashdod is mentioned specifically in the uh, uh, New Testament. And the book of in the book of Acts, uh, it refers to Azotus as the place in which Philip, Philip the evangelist, uh, not the apostle, uh, not the evangelist that wrote one of the books here, yeah, but one of seven seven chosen deacons here, yeah? the famous Philip. Reappeared, he was on his way uh, from Jerusalem to the south, and uh, on the way he converted this the famous thing that he converted the Ethiopian eunuch to Christianity, and this eunuch presumably brought the Christianity to Africa. And Philip was taken by Holy Spirit and transported to Azotus. And according to the book of Acts, from Azotus, he started his journey toward the north, towards Caesarea his hometown, uh, uh, prophesizing and baptizing along the, along the, in all his way from Azotos to Caesarea to the north. So Azotos was the starting point of Philip's journey uh, on his way uh, of baptizing the region. And probably this is, this is something which should be uh, taken uh, very seriously, this testament. Uh, um, and uh, uh, this is just to remind you about uh, Philip's connection to, uh, uh, to Azotos. On, also, uh, it's worth to mention that Philip, Philip, according to tradition, had four daughters, four virgin daughters, which possessed uh, uh, the powers, special, they, they were blessed with special powers of prophecies and the uh, who knows, maybe this special role for women in this church that we discovered in this church of deaconess is somehow connected to this tradition. I have no idea. I will not embark on this father. Uh, just a few words about the era. The era is very unusual. It is the, uh, the era uh, that they use in this church. It is era that is based on the millennium of Rome. Uh, and the millennium of Rome, it is the era that is used by Georgians. Uh, Georgians, and also to a certain degree it was used by Armenians, but in, in particular in Georgians. Georgians have developed this new chronological system that started the millennium year of the city of Rome, celebrated by Philippus Arabs, and comprised cycles of 532 years, the so-called chronica. The single chronicon is 532 years. Yeah? Counting back 12 cycles from the first chronicon led to a date of the creation, 5604 before the birth of Christ. Now we have, in, the thing is that in Georgia, at the beginning we were thinking that maybe we are dealing with Georgian monks here. Uh, because there are uh, historical uh, evidence, this historical evidence about uh, 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 presence of uh, Georgian, uh, Georgian uh, spiritual leaders in, this, uh, in, in the place of Azotus, so we know that Peter the Iberian uh, preached in the city of Azotus uh, uh, just before he passed away. Peter the Iberian, the famous Peter the Iberian, uh, he spent almost a year in Azotus Paralios, uh, and he was taken later on to Yamniton Limen, uh, to, uh, to the state villa of Edokia, and he died there, but he was actually sitting in Azotus, and we know this from Vita of... Uh, 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 of him uh, uh, written by John Rufus, yeah? Uh, so we, first, we, we, we thought that maybe some Georgian connection is here, but the dates are much earlier here in Ashdod. They are much earlier than anything attested so far in Georgia. So now, Leadiseni, who was the one who developed this idea, of course, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, 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 translated the inscriptions, she, she, she is under the impression that this era that uh, celebrates the millennium of Rome uh, and, and, and creates the, and counting back uh, to the creation of the world using this chronica, it was, all, it was actually created in Azotos Paralios and adapted by Georgian monks, and later on it was uh, transferred to Georgia. 
So I don't know if it's uh, if it's so. We'll see. But we actually the article is already in press where we present uh, the stratigraphy and architecture of the church and the full translation of all inscriptions. It is already in press in Liberanos. It will be out just in a few months from now. So we are very quick. And I'm coming to an end. Uh, during the excavation, uh, we had a very unusual visit. So uh, I had a phone suddenly out of the blue. Uh, and on phone, I, uh, I had the Patriarch of Jerusalem a uh, uh, Greek Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, and they asked uh, for permission to come and visit and to make a liturgy in the play in the newly discovered place. So we, of course, we agreed, and we had this very, very unusual uh, uh, ceremony for any archaeological excavation. So suddenly, during the excavation, we had uh, hundreds of visitors in one particular day which uh, we've decided we are going to dedicate to this uh, occasion. It was very, very touching, I have to say. Uh, so I just show you a few uh, more slides. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Theophilus III, the, the uh, uh, Greek Patriarch of Jerusalem, with all the heads of uh, uh, local uh, uh, Greek Orthodox uh, monasteries uh, in Israel and uh, Palestine. And then and even from Jordan, people came from all around. So they visited us and, uh, uh, and we've discussed future, uh, future opportunities and future possibilities, how we would like to develop this site, how we would like to preserve this site for, for, for future generation. And this is still under discussion, but of course, nothing is going to be built there. And the, the site is protected. The idea is to develop this into a sort of a museum, but also the church, they want they wanted to make a place of worship. I don't know if it, it is going to happen. It is a political decision. It's not uh, under my jurisdiction. I hope it will happen because I certainly see no problem with that. Uh, and here, I think I, I, I'm coming to an end and just, uh, uh, what is time? Yeah, I think it should be it. Just show you that uh, the quest is not over. This is the place where we started with this Byzantine church. Uh, and I've started to collect, uh, I've started to collect uh, information from local inhabitants. What, what uh, uh, you know, from local archives, from local, uh, uh, from people who, uh, who arrived to Ashdod in the 60s and late 50s of the last century, uh, the first Jewish settlers who came to Ashdod and settled there. So I started to collect all kinds of, uh, uh, photographs from the archives and to see what's going on around here. And suddenly I realized that there was an, there is another church here. There is a church here. So there, there was an inscription that was ruined uh, from the fifth century, it seems. It was ruined uh, also somewhere in the 90s, but the church is still there. And there is another church to the north. So this is the one we excavated, and there are two more churches at least. Uh, uh, toward the, the sea, and uh, just a look uh, it's from local archives of, of peoples of Ashdod, what kind of marble, these are con from Constantinopolis, yeah, these kind of capitals, these are imperial capitals. So they were just found uh, in the sands uh, in 80s of the last century, and uh, you see this is black and white uh, photograph, so just a few months ago, we conducted a, a very thorough, with Paul Brinza, whom I already mentioned, we've conducted a very thorough uh, magnetometric and uh, uh, radar penetrating, uh, uh, GPR, ground penetrating radar analysis investigation of this area in hope that we will uh, excavate this compound as well in the near future. And last summer, and here I certainly will, uh, will stop, Last summer, we've decided that we are going to connect the remains discovered in the sea with the terrestrial remains. So what we did, we spent a few weeks uh, traveling uh, uh, with the boat because we knew, uh, but we, we, we have a lot of indications for, uh, for uh, sunken wrecks in the area. Uh, of Ashdod and Ashkelon, all this area should be full of sunken wrecks. So what we did, 
And even uh, you see this, this comes from the area of Ashdod. This is seventh century BC helmet, Corinthian helmet of Greek mercenary. This is what I was interested in from the beginning until the luck took me to Byzantine uh, adventure. But I would still like to go, uh, come back to my original interest. So we went to the sea for two weeks with a huge ship that, that came from Malta. Uh, and we surveyed this area with a very serious equipment, with robotic vehicles, with the sonar, with the, uh, even with the small submarine, which can house up to three crew members. So we even use the submarine here. Uh, and here I'm finishing just to show you some nice photos at the end. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't find any ancient wrecks some pottery, some anchors from Byzantine Islamic period, but no ancient one. Here you see an, a, a sunken wreck, but this is modern, not ancient. But again, it was a nice adventure. We will certainly continue this. It's a cooperation with Israel Antiquities Authority, with Kobi Sharvit, the head of the underwater division in the Israel Antiquities Authority, and the Israeli survey uh, organization. Uh, with Ronnie Sadeh, who works there. So we created this consortium uh, where different uh, governmental bodies and university are cooperating together. And just to show you a nice picture, what, what I did the last summer, what we did, we just, uh, 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 I, I don't know, I felt like uh, Captain Nemo, yeah, uh, with this submarine. It's really, it was really, really amazing underwater. But as I said, unfortunately, no ancient wrecks so far, but they will come sooner or later. So I think that here I will stop. Thank you very much. I already took uh, too much of your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex. This was a truly fascinating presentation. And it's fascinating in many respects, uh, but first and foremost for, uh, exploring so systematically and employing all kinds of available techniques, methods and means to uh, explore this complex uh, multi-period site so systematically uh, and dealing with such um, professionalism, not just the period that you're interested in, and I'm sure many people can in this virtual room can relate with this feeling, but also with periods that we, as you mentioned, didn't know much about, including the Hellenistic and the Byzantine, it, may, it seems that, that you are going to be a Byzantinist in, in the region uh, after exploring so uh, intensively the, the, those centuries of uh, uh, in, in, in theological terms. Yes, I have no I'm... complaints. I, uh, as I said, it's, uh, for, for me, it's not a problem to switch uh, to later periods uh, with these finds, yes. I think it's worthy of reconsidering the path. It's so, so challenging to, to deal with such a site. I, I definitely agree. Um, a multi-period site whose preservation seems although so rich. Archaeologically, its preservation varies from, you know, from area to area, as you illustrated. So I won't say um, anything more. I will just